Hello, IDME listeners. Anna Guzman, Space Ambassador, here with an interview that is less technical and more inspirational. Estella Hernandez Gillette gives us an oral history that starts with a young immigrant woman hired by NASA straight out of high school during the space race in 1964. Her experiences and points of view are very different than those you would expect from a Hispanic woman who started her career during that era. In this interview, you'll hear the highlights of Estella's career of 41 years at NASA working with engineers, astronauts, and top executives during one of the most exciting times in human spaceflight. Even after retirement as a professor of human resources management at the University of Houston, she continues to inspire and mentor tomorrow's workforce. I hope you enjoy this interview. Thank you, Estella, for taking time for this interview. I'm really excited to chat with you about your experience in aerospace at NASA and the things you're up to today. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Okay. Who are you? Uh, I am Dr. Estela Hernandez Gillette. I come from Monterrey, Nuevo León, Mexico. I came over at, at, at two as a family of migrant workers, and we settled in Houston, and I grew up in Houston. So tell me that your experience as a child growing up here in the U.S. and as a child of immigrants. You, you know, the stories I hear are stories I I hear. I was only two, so I don't remember the experience myself. Whatever I remember is, is a, that happened to me as a child is probably based on the stories that I heard. But it was a hard time. And uh, I have my mother's documentation. She wrote everything. So I've been reading up on why we came over and all of that. The hardest transition, I think, was when I started school in, in kindergarten. And uh, the transition from learn, from speaking Spanish totally at home to having to pick up the English in school. I, I think because I had a, a deficiency in the language, I wasn't a very good student. I was a C student, a D student in conduct. I, I think it was because <laughs> <laughs> I could not participate. Yeah. So I would misbehave. And I, I saw that later in other children. Uh, so I think that was the hard transition. The other transition I remember was when we moved from Canal Street, which was predominantly Mexican Im mm. uh, immigrants, to a neighborhood off of Houston Avenue that was more uh, Tex-Mex. And the kids there at Crockett Elementary, this was fourth grade, would laugh because I couldn't speak English. And mm. it's interesting how the gears shifted and I became very conscious of learning the language correctly. I had a great teacher, Miss Thompson, who, who was good and, and attentive to my needs. Yeah. So, so after that, it was not a difficult thing for me. Um, I think also at home, my mom was uh, very encouraging about school and the, the importance of school. She'd been exposed to a little bit of the, the, the benefits of education back in Mexico. Uh, my dad was just hardworking. He was a laborer and always about dignity and respect and treat others well, that kind of thing. So when I got to high school, that again was a point where I began to transition into learning more about uh, experiences from joining uh, the choir, the National Honor Society. My parents really weren't in favor of my doing that, but since it was during school, I would do all of that. And, <laughs> and, and so I became kind of a joiner. Mm -hmm. I, I was actually a treasurer for our senior class, and uh, that was my introduction to NASA. It's interesting how that happened, because in 63, which is the year I graduated, our yearbook featured the original seven astronauts, and the background for a lot of the pictures was NASA, the meatball. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about NASA until then. So leading up to that point, you during your studies, were you a little bit attracted to the sciences or technology? Actually, if, if, if I had to do it over again, mm -hmm. and if I'd had the support that students have now, I would have gone into biology. Uh -huh. I love biology. Mm -hmm. I love the teacher, and I just love the science part of it. Yeah. My mother, though, had been a secretary in Mexico, so the four older children down to me were all secretaries, even my brother. So you were in, you had to do typewriting? Yeah. and we, we did, uh, and, and Jeff Davis had an excellent secretarial training program. So we had typing, we had shorthand, we had 
accounting, you know, the basics of, of administrative work. One of the reasons that I got into NASA was because I could do shorthand, mm-hmm. and that was kind of a extra thing. And I couldn't get into NASA in until I became a U.S. citizen. So yeah. I had to wait till I was 18. Then I was naturalized. Then I applied for NASA. The place I went to work to to work to right after high school was the W. H. Curtin and Company, and they needed people who spoke Spanish. I never lost the Spanish. Mm-hmm. My mother insisted that we read, write, so all of us read, write, and and speak it correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I went to the Curtin Company, they were looking for clerical support in the in the um, export department. Mm-hmm. So my job became to translate. Um, apparatus, chemical apparatus, oh, uh, equipment wow. and all that. Yeah. And then my boss discovered that I could take shorthand and we had our little corner and he moved me next to him because he could dictate. And then I could translate into Spanish. Mm-hmm. So he would dictate in English and then he would, then I would translate into Spanish. So the language was always a plus, the shorthand was a plus. Mm-hmm. And then I still type 98 words a minute. So, you wow. know, there were, skills were really important to me. Yeah. So set the stage for me, um, 1964, mm-hmm. that's when you started at NASA. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about your first day when you walked in through those doors and saw all those men and you were probably the only woman there, right? Pretty much. Uh, and the only Hispanic there probably, Pretty much. right? Yes. Um, take us back to that. How did it feel? How, how did you deal with it? Well, back up a little bit. I started in October, October 19th, 1964. It's a memorable day for me. So I tested right before, and I got three interviews at NASA, mm-hmm. and I got three job offers. Uh-huh. And I went home, I was still living at home on Sharon Street, and I told my parents that I'm gonna go work at NASA. And my mother says, no, you're not. <laughs> I said, yes, I am. And she said, it's too far. And what are you gonna do with all those white men? <laughs> That's exactly what she said. <laughs> Con todos los hombres, los hombres blancos, you know. Yeah. And so I, I said, Mother, they offered me a job, so they must want me, you yeah. know. But we don't have a car. I said, I will buy one. <laughs> I have more. I will be making more money. This is the struggle with immigrant yeah. parents. Yes. It's, yes. They come to America, but they don't want their children to, you know, fly off the nest and... We're still Realize the American dream. Yes, right. I mean, we're, we were still them. at home, and you know, that's another story altogether. I was the fourth child, and things had not changed a whole lot. However, I think my spirit of rebellion paid off because <laughs> they gave in and they said, okay, we'll let you try it. So the first day at NASA, I was put into a pool of stenos in the HR department, mm-hmm. personnel department. And the phone rang, and the lady that was my mentor the phone was ringing and she says, answer it. And I said, what do I say? I mean, you don't say hello. Do you say National Aeronautics and Space Administration? Do I say NASA? Do I say my name? Yes. I said, I know how to answer the phone, but what do I say here? A Mm -hmm. big step in the future for me. Then, uh, so I did, and I was there for two or three days. Then, Then I was taken to building 13. It was the South west corner of the building, second floor, introduced to the boss, and he said, hi. I sat down, he said, this is your desk. Have a good life at at Manned Spacecraft Center, something like that. (laughs) And that was my orientation, okay. So you had to sink or swim. Yeah, and so all white guys literally wearing the black slacks and the white shirts and the skinny ties, that was the era and a pocket protector. My husband still has his. So um, (laughs) it it was, they were all very nice, Mm -hmm. but it was like they didn't know what to do with me. And I don't think it was It almost like they felt uncomfortable. Uh, Well, they didn't know what to do with me because I was new Uh and you know, I'm like all perky and stuff. And so he gives me a memo and he says, can you type this for me? Yes, I can type, you know. Well, the format was totally different to what anything I had done. Oh, and then he says, and don't forget about the concurrences. And I said, okay, and I didn't know what a concurrence was. <laughs> and there was no Google, you know, to quick <laughs> yeah. look it up yet. So I, there was a name at the bottom. The name was Maxime Faget. 
Mm. And he was going to sign, that person was going to sign the memo. So I thought, well, I will just call Maximilien Fugé and ask him what a concurrence is. So I get the phone book, I call, and this, somebody answers Dr. Fugé's office. And I said, may I speak to Maxime? And she says, this is Dr. Fugé's office. May I help you? And I said, yeah. So I told her. And I thanked her. She helped me. A few yeah. minutes later, here comes the lead secretary in our building. And she says, I understand you called Dr. Fugé's office. I said, yes. And the secretary was very helpful. She says, in the future, you're not to call his office. He is the director of engineering, and you're not to call <laughs> I mean, he could have been the Pope for all I knew because yeah. I, nobody bothered to introduce me to, you know, the line, or, the chain of command. Nothing. Yes. That was that was my orientation. No organizational chart. Nothing. 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 Yeah. And so Marion became my mentor from then on. So you you inherit mentors by choice or or by just default. Okay. Mm-hmm. I felt very comfortable after that. One day, this was October when I started in January, one day this young man walks into my office and he says, do you have any pencils? And I said, in the supply cabinet, right there. And he goes, do you have any whatever? And I'm like, I don't. Oh, he and wanted you to he, hand it to he, him. Well, he, I don't think he knew what he wanted. <laughs> Turns out I married him a few years later. Oh! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how we met. He was a student engineer from Drexel in Philadelphia. He was coming for his internship. And, yeah. and so that was one thing that I've always said I would never marry out of my culture. And, you know, oh, we didn't marry right away. Never say never. Never say never. <laughs> right. So, um, but that's kind of a side story. So, anyway, um, I was there for a year. We moved from that location to Building 49, the, the Twin Towers over there. Have, mm-hmm. We have vibration and acoustics. We were brand new in that building, my little branch. Paid went along, my husband and several other engineers. And um, the vibration and acoustic facility was very technical. Mm-hmm. But my job was to tend to the guys. I, I did their typing, I did their travel orders, I made their coffee answered all their phones, I, I did all their reports, very manual job. And at this time, they were in the thick of it of working for this the Apollo was missions? And, 1964, yeah. so we were still doing uh, Gemini, Mercury. Mm-hmm. Mercury was finishing, Gemini was next. We were getting into the Apollo era. Mm-hmm. Now, I knew that it was important. I knew that there was space stuff. Yeah. I knew what engineers did, but I only knew what I was working on and you know the reports that I typed and all that uh, I learned the terminology but I really didn't know what they meant you know mm-hmm. the beauty of it is that you know now 50 years later people ask me as if I would have known back then what I was doing but you really learn retrospectively because whatever you learn you've learned from the stories and, and all of that 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 you heard through the years, Mm -hmm. but it was a great era. I mean, working for 21 guys, all of them very polite, very, nobody was, was nasty or or the sexual harassment stuff, none of that. Very open environment. Um, Do you feel that maybe might have to do with the type of personality or character that you are? I think so. I I, I think. Like maybe they kind of sense this is, Estella's not someone we should mess with. Well, and and, you know, my my customs, my costumbres, you know, from home, uh, that you act proper and and you dress properly and, you know, you you, You you don't pick up on any, I mean, like they would use the F word. And I just would pretend I didn't hear it because I'd heard it before. I didn't yeah. know exactly what it meant. But they were very, um, I remember one time they were all standing around drinking coffee because the pot was right there at my in my area. And one of them dropped the F word. Oh. And the others got real quiet. And I just continued <laughs> typing, you know, like I didn't hear it. Because that was the environment. And yeah. and. It was male dominated. It, yeah. it did come from a, a strain of military where men do talk like, that way and all that. But I never felt like somebody's taking advantage of, of me because I'm a young girl or because I'm Hispanic or Mexican or whatever we yeah. called ourselves at the time. Yeah. So so it was. Um, it, I was part of the team. Yeah. And and I always felt that way. I had a task to contribute, and that's why I was there. 
Do you recall the moment when you or your team realized this is going to happen? We're going to the moon. It, there was really, at the time, mm -hmm. there was very little doubt that we would. So you, you guys were like moving straight yeah. on and there yeah. was no turning back. There, the, were no, there was no doubt. The only obstacles would have been technical. Mm -hmm. if something, and you know how many yes. uh, spacecraft flew up. Yes. Okay. But there was money, there was public support, there was government support. Uh, there was a lot of support because we were doing this. There was a reason. It mm -hmm. was the Russians had done it. We were still getting out of you know the war and the Cold War, it, so so there were a lot of influences that there was no doubt that we were going to do it. Yeah. Okay. There was there were very strong reasons why we had to do this, and mm -hmm. that's the way everybody moved forward. Yeah. It seems to me, um, in looking at the documentaries and interviews and all that, that um, NASA as a whole or Johnson Space Center as a whole. Everybody, it didn't matter what department you were in. It, there was a sense of camaraderie and a unity yes. behind yes. the goal. People are like that. If you have a, a goal and a focus, yeah. everybody gets on the same page. Yeah. When you don't have a well-defined role and responsibility and all that, people will flounder, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's a waste that starts happening. At that point, I can honestly say that this was one big ship. That we were all moving in the same direction. Yeah. And, and it... Again, you know, roles were different in significance, mm -hmm. but I can honestly say that if I ever write the book, it's going to be called We Were the Wind Beneath Their Wings. Yes. Because we launched them with and that, the administrative people. That's a misperception a lot of people had. When I, uh, when I was a kid and I would visit Kennedy Space Center, I grew up in Florida, um, I was under the impression I would never work for NASA because I... You know, I wasn't strong in the sciences, and you had to be either an astronaut or engineer or scientist to work at NASA. But, you know, you're living proof, I'm living proof that there's a support system that's needed for the missions to be yep. successful. Yep. And there, there are jobs in all kinds of well career areas. I would say at, at that time, there were probably 75% of the population was, was technical, mm -hmm. okay? going to the moon kind of people. The rest of us were administrative, finance, procurement, that kind of people. The numbers started to change through the years, and it decreased the, the technical as we became more of a bureaucracy. Yeah. The, the, the bureaucratic stuff started to gain, you know, the numbers of people who do that kind of work. Uh, but at that time, it was very, very well defined. We're, we're scientists, rocket scientists, and that's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. So being a part of that... Um, and, you know, I just recently was cleaning out files and stuff, and I found, like, a picture of myself with Cliff Charlesworth. He was Apollo 11 and Apollo 13. You'll see him in the documentaries and all that. Mm -hmm. And he had signed for me. I was his secretary years later, not too many years later, but he had signed for me a, a roundup. Mm -hmm. And it said, to E, secretary, outstanding secretary of all years, because I was his secretary and it was after the Apollo era, but he was such a, a challenge to work with, mm -hmm. yet he felt that I would be the outstanding secretary forever. I mean, to me, that was such a credit to what I was doing at the time. Yeah. You know, you don't say just a secretary. Right. Okay? So tell me about your career advancement. You, you advanced into other areas yeah. at NASA. It was, it was a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I had, uh, NASA was really good about training, whether it was a course on site or, or going off to U of H Clear Lake. Uh, I, I was a secretary till 79. And then at the executive secretary, the HR guy was, was he would wait for my boss, he, that Cliff Charlesworth was my boss. And he would wait for my boss, and so we started to chat. We would talk about goals and careers and stuff like that. So he got to know me, and then he got promoted to be the uh, manager for the astronaut selection process. This was 79, 80. Um, and he asked me to be his assistant. So now I'm a paraprofessional, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't have a degree yet. I'm still kind of administrative, mm -hmm. but I'm now HR. I went. And I picked up so much of the HR process that that opened up a whole new field for me. Uh, while I was there, uh, we qualified about, I think it was about 3,200 people for the process. 
From that process, you went to 500 well-qualified. From that, you went to 120 that would be interviewed. And from that, they selected 21 people. So you can imagine this upside down pyramid, yeah. you know, where you start with a whole bunch and then you end up with a few. And back then you didn't have a computer to scan the no. resume. <laughs> no, we did it manually. Oh we my goodness. We did it manually. So my job became kind of to check the, the, the qualifications. They had it or they didn't have it. Yeah. And then as we process, process the applications, then the astronauts would come in, the selection board came in, it was mostly senior astronauts, and, and Mr. Abbey was the chair of the committee, there were about 12 of them, and they reviewed those applications, mm -hmm. and that's how they began to thin out, and then they actually sat through the interviews, and then we, I was the lead for the admin support, we had about six young women, and the computers were just coming in, so I actually took a course on how to use them just in case my boss needed me to call something up. I didn't have to use them, but I thought it was important. Yeah, That's another thing. You, you start collecting tools as much as you can because you never know when you're, you're going to need them. Right. So then um, he, uh, it was a big challenge, major task, but we accomplished it. The astronauts came in, and then I got moved to uh, staffing, mm -hmm. where then I became... Uh, involved with the summer programs and the internships and stuff like that. Still reviewing uh, applications and all that. But I'd had such great practice uh, reviewing the applications for yeah, astronauts. Nothing can be more daunting than that. Yeah. Yeah, so now going downward to students yeah. and, and uh, interns was a whole lot easier. Uh -huh. you know. And my boss there, Greg, was extremely difficult. He was the same HR guy, but he was a different kind of guy when it came to, to that, and he was kind of a perfectionist. So I picked up some really good skills, but also the ability to deal with a personality. And, you know, we ended up being friends and all still are, but it was, again, a transition of working for somebody who wasn't as senior as I had been working with. Mm -hmm. He was more junior, but he was still the boss, you know, that kind of thing. And then I got an offer to go to the Equal Opportunity Programs office mm -hmm. as the women's program manager. I got introduced to the world of equal opportunity, affirmative action. I liked it, but it wasn't quite right yet. In 1964, affirmative action came into the private sector. In 1972, it came to the federal sector. Oh, okay. interesting. So in 1972, the federal sector said, okay, everybody, you're going to have to start recruiting women and minorities for sure. Okay. Well. When you get into a program like like NASA, there are for sure qualifications that you have to have. Mm -hmm. And so you still have to look for the qualifications. One of the issues that was that we didn't have a big workforce that had all of those qualifications among the women and minorities. Okay, You look for, for candidates in a relevant civilian labor force. I'm not going to look in all, in all the Hispanic uh, employment opportunities or places that I can go look for Hispanics. I only look for those who have the skills I need. Okay. Yeah. And th that's a percentage that I use for comparison. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you hear people say, well, you know, look at all the Hispanics and you only have, you know, this percentage of, of engineers at NASA. Well, then outreach starts happening. Yeah. Then you get interested in, let's get them started when they're little so that you can produce a workforce. So I got really involved with the outreach. And so that was an issue, I imagine, with the astronaut selection. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because women weren't allowed really in certain areas of the military, which right. were like flight requirements and whatnot. Right. So, so when you say, you know, certain people were excluded, mm -hmm. well, the first thing you have to look for is what are the qualifications? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you have to look as well, can they, can they go to places where they can be qualified? Mm -hmm. Okay. And if those don't exist, or, or there are barriers, then you're never going to produce a workforce that can meet the qualifications. So I, I'm in the astronaut, I'm, I'm in the federal women's program. I'm in EO, and I get recruited to go to the astronaut office mm -hmm. as chief of admin support, okay? Mm -hmm. Still no degree. The guy who is the chair of the committee, the selection board, recruited me. 
and he said, I'd like you to come work in the astronaut office. There were 30 women all God in support. God bless you. Yes. We know a lot of stories. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I promised I wouldn't write the book. <laughs> yeah. But there were 30 women, half contractor, half civil servant. And he wanted me to go lead that group from everything from ordering underwear for the astronauts to oh, sending no. them with travel orders <laughs> to space. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there were... Uh, appearances, lots of, of activity with the astronauts. So we, at this time, the shuttle missions had already started, yes, right? Yes, now we're into shuttle. Yeah, okay. this is 1983. Mm -hmm. We'd just begun with the ALT and Crippen and, and the Truly and all of that. So I go over there. The HR guy that talked to me about it said, you'll be crazy if you go there. He said, it's like a snake pit. <laughs> because it was like, oh, this, this, this organization. And, but the guy who offered me the job had watched me work when I was doing the astronaut selection process. Mm -hmm. And so he got interested. And when I refused, I actually turned down the job because I really liked what I was doing in EO and I'd just gotten a promotion. And that was in the equal, equal, opportunity, equal opportunity and affirmative action okay. kind of stuff. And uh, the guy, the boss, Mr. Abby, offers me, finally, he says, how about if I make it a supervisory admin officer? So I said, yes, I'll go. So when I got to the astronaut office, the, the way they had done things was that they would assign secretaries by crews. So we have a crew for STS-1, STS-2, all of that. And the secretaries, as soon as the crews returned, uh, were reassigned. So they didn't have like a boss, a constant boss. Mm -hmm. And so what they made me was the constant boss. They were still going to be crew secretaries, but then they were going to report to me and I would administer, you know, assignments and that kind of stuff. We also had uh, the appearances area that handled about 4,000 requests for appearances per year. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, two or three ladies that handled it. No computers. We had no computers yet. Oh, wow. So we had nine secretaries, uh, you know, a few ladies in appearances. And then we had another area that was all of the special projects, the patches, the I mentioned the underwear, they would order that, they ran the gym, uh, all of the the logos that you see for the different missions, they were created there mm -hmm. in the mail room. So I was there for six and a half years. Mm -hmm. I was there for Challenger. I was there for return to flight, uh, STS-26. Challenger was a humongous experience that, that I had never had, hopefully. Well, we had it again, but it wasn't the same impact for me as it was with Challenger. I had been around these astronauts who were killed. I had met their families. I had, uh, we had, my whole team was supporting everything they did, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and they were all good, good people. I mean, they're, they're, it was fun working with the astronauts because you had different personalities. Yeah. But they also respected authority, and all I had to say was, okay, well, we'll tell the boss. I'll tell the boss that we disagreed to do this. Oh, okay, we'll do it. You know, that kind <laughs> of thing. Uh, so we made life very comfortable for them. And, and to this day, you know, I believe that, that I was taking care of America's heroes, and that was my job. And mm -hmm. that was the job of the 30 people that worked with me. Eventually, though, I got my degree. I was going to night school the whole time. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, summer of uh, 86, I finished and I got my degree. And then I got a job offer to go back to HR development this time with um, uh, oversight of the secretarial and the communications programs. Mm -hmm. So I went mm -hmm. and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And I hated leaving the astronaut office but it was time and you know, I developed a few people so they could take over. And pretty soon I was doing some of the training. I started a one week orientation for new secretaries. I knew what I had gone through as a new secretary. Yes. So I built the one week and, and gave them some real basics. And then um, we had a call for, um, one boss called me and there was a, uh, Asian person who was not speaking very well and he couldn't present very well. Great engineer, but his, he could, nobody could understand him. Mm -hmm. So he says to me, and you guys aren't doing anything about it. And I said, well, I can't unless I know he works for you, not for me. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, started um, English enhancement, speaking uh, enhancement, and they loved it. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, they, we would have a small classes, so I came up with that. And so th there were lots of 
developmental kinds of things that I know would have worked for me, so I would implement things that I wished I'd had, mm -hmm. you know, when it was my turn. Uh, eventually, though, I had an offer to go to NASA headquarters for a um, um, developmental opportunity. And I became the uh, assistant to the guy who was in charge. He was a new guy, NASA headquarters, lawyer, very, very nice guy. And he was in charge of small business and disadvantaged business there at NASA to give opportunities to small businesses mm -hmm. to do business with NASA. And he was brand new. So the guy that had hired me to go work in the astronaut office was now at headquarters. And he drafted me to go work oh. for this guy. Yeah, another <laughs> networking kind of thing. Yeah. So I was there for 120 days. Very, very interesting uh, experience because he had to respond to the Congress every day. There was some kind of congressional inquiry. Oh, lucky Everything him. dropped. And, yeah. <laughs> and so I got, I got a, a good taste of the culture there that was very run by the politics and yes, dealing with yes, government yes. funding and all of that the ask for that the we didn't understand down here yeah you know that that frequency that uh and, and i mean and everything dropped for the next congressperson who was asking yeah. you know it was the first time i lived by myself four months four months in an apartment mm -hmm. in downtown dc mm -hmm. i could ride the metro i could walk you know, having gone from my parents' admit, home, it was empowering and it, liberating, it was, wasn't it? It was very, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only time that I've lived by myself. So from there, the job for deputy director of equal opportunity became open. Mm -hmm. And so while I was in D.C., I applied. And so I never went back to HR development. Mm -hmm. I went straight to the deputy job in equal opportunity. That boss was moved. Mm -hmm. He was moved and then he was ready to retire. But his job became open, Director of Equal Opportunity, and I applied and I got it. That job was now uh, included a position on the Astronaut Selection Board. So I now I had made the full, full circle. circle. Yeah, <laughs> so it was, it was really cool. I was there for 10 years in that job. In the meantime, I finished my, my master's um, just because I thought if I don't get promoted, there was a little period where I wasn't moving, getting promotions. And I thought if I don't get promoted by this time, then I will have my master's and I'll go teach. Mm -hmm. So even then I was already thinking teaching. In the meantime though, I got the master's, I got promoted twice. And then I was, um, you know, the years passed and you kind of get stagnant. Yes. You know, and, and again, I thought, well, I'll just go back to school. So this opportunity came up called the SES CDP, the Senior Executive Service Career Development Program. So you, you work for a federal agency. They give you about two years of, of very, very good training, including spending time in the congressional, looking at the operation there. I mean, just stuff that I wished I'd had much sooner mm -hmm. in my career. But the best thing was, at the very end, they ask you, well, what is your action plan to include additional development? And I said, I've, one of my cohorts had gone to George Washington University to this residential program. I said, I'd like that. And I got it. And oh, I got wow. in. So it was oh. two years, two, 2002, 2004, of coursework. Once a month, I would fly to Washington for a long weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I went back to work for the same boss that I had many years ago. And then I had, um, but at the time, then I thought, you know, I think I'm done. <laughs> I was a GS-15. I was getting ready to graduate. I was almost 60 years old. Okay. You, you just sounded like Forrest Gump there. Yeah. Really? You know, running, I mean, running, 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 and all yeah, of a sudden. You go and you go and you go and then you think. I'm satisfied. I think this yeah. is it. So my boss there in external relations, he said, you'll know when it's time. I was out at Ellington. It was the the STS 114. It was a return to to flight after mm -hmm. Columbia, and I'm watching all of these younger people running around doing their thing, you know, and all the P PAO kind of stuff. And and I thought, there's not anything else that I want to learn to do here. I've gone as far as I can. I wasn't going to wait for the senior executive, which was the next step. Yeah. And my mom was in her 90s she was living with us at the other house we had and i thought i need to spend time with her my dad had died in 91 
and my sons were grown and I thought, I think it's time. I went back and I told my boss, I said, I'm gonna give you, this was like summer. I said, I'll give you to the end of the year, then I'm leaving. And he said, that's good because I'm leaving the next year. <laughs> so we both had our plan. And in the meantime though, I, I was finishing the dissertation. I didn't finish that for a while, but I did retire in 06. My husband retired the same day I did. So combined we had 84 years of service. We had a nice party at the Gilworth Center and the, the table decorations were the Gemini, the Mercury, the, I borrowed them from public yeah. affairs. The, all of the different programs that we were there for mm -hmm. and the cake had a big NASA and an 84 on it. Couldn't lovely. ask for more. We had 250 people who came to the party. Oh, lovely. Couldn't ask for more. I was extremely satisfied with what I did. So it sounds to me that you saw a lot throughout the decades and, and were a part or maybe even a catalyst to change in the areas you work. How do you uh, summarize the change as far as making the workforce more diverse? The astronaut process is a, it's a good example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we couldn't hire women pilots. Mm -hmm. Why? Because women pilots, you don't rent a pilot, you know, 3,000 pound thrust per engine airplane to go get Yeah, because experience. that's equivalent to a fighter yeah. jet, right? Yes, you have to yeah. go into the military. Well, guess what? Women were not allowed into the test pilot school probably until 1972, mm. okay? So now if, if the law, if, if enough people don't ask, may I, or, or let's do it, then nothing changes. The change is when the law says, okay, everybody, you will do it. Mm -hmm. If you want government funding, you will do this. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants government funding. So like Eileen Collins, she was the first woman pilot. Well, she was one of the first to go to pi test pilot school. Mm -hmm. And guess what? She qualified. Mm -hmm. And I tell my students now, you know, on a range of, of one to 10, mm -hmm. uh, if you're qualified, it's, you just have to qualify in that range. If you want highly qualified, then you have to qualify in the upper range. The program said qualified. So it wasn't necessarily that NASA was making a conscious effort to hire more women. It just happens that they had the qualifications. Well, because, because the qualifications are so well expressed mm -hmm. and that's what you're looking for mm -hmm. and we couldn't find any, we had a good reason not to hire them. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then because the law says you should, mm -hmm. and, and remember the, the program was developed in the 50s. It was test pilots. Mm -hmm. There were no women in that environment. It was, um, you know, there were astronauts before NASA even mm -hmm. formed because you have to be uh, to 50 miles into space and you're technically an astronaut. Right. Okay. Um, and so, there was no push for anybody else that they had enough. And there was also a time where astronauts had to have military background, whereas yes. now... It was about four classes in mm -hmm. that, that they decided, we don't need, now we need scientists, yeah. okay? and they don't all come from the military. Right. Uh, so we need to, and, and that, that in itself opened up other opportunities, mm -hmm. because now we don't just need scientists, uh, we don't just need pilots, we need, and there were women in science and engineering already, medical doctors, scientists. I mean, history has a lot of early women that we don't really credit that they were there already, mm -hmm. okay? But there weren't a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So when you, of course, the program only took a handful each time, okay? Yeah. And my role as EO director when I was on the committee was women and minorities, that was my focus. Mm -hmm. And so my focus was to make sure that we looked at all of the qualifications and my battle was, okay, here's somebody who's qualified, but their GPA is only 2.5. Then we got a bunch of white guys up here that are 4.0, 3.9, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. So do you, you know, yeah. exclude them just because of that? Mm -hmm. The rule says qualify, okay. Yeah. What happened though, the, those applicants that I saw, 2.5, 2.1, were, um, they would then go to graduate school, and in graduate school, they would get 4.0. What does that tell you? Yeah. 
they can do it. Yeah. You just need the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And that was my, my goal was to make sure that everybody who applied had enough of a, uh, that we were looking at their applications well enough to pick up on those little potential tidbits. Okay. Right. It got easier. Even in the 10 years, it got easier. You could readily find people. The, the, the qualifications that I saw in, in the astronaut program got better and better. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, as, as, um, as women, after World War II, mm-hmm. women really went into, the, into college and they started doing the science and math and all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, until then, I mean, society just didn't, wasn't right. real encouraging for women to do kinds, all kinds of stuff. So where do you get the, work, the workforce if it doesn't exist? So the laws change. Um, and NASA started partnering more with the colleges and the universities the and the high schools yes, yes. to help grow to build the talent. That, yes, yeah. to grow our own. Mm-hmm. And you know, about thirty-five years of my forty years at NASA were spent in Outreach mm-hmm. because we strongly believe that specifically for the minorities, you had to have examples, you had to have role models, you had to have. You know, so those few of us who were there started to go out into the community and talk to the little kids. And what's an engineer? What's a secretary? Some of them had no idea. Mm-hmm. So, so being able to relate to them, and a lot of those are now at NASA. So what are the demographics like from the day you started to the day you left as far as the workforce, the percentages of it, It's probably 50-50, and, and I don't have those. But by the time I left, it was pushing... To it was 50, 50 maybe 40 something to 51% or something of women. Mm-hmm. And then the, the breakdown of minorities wasn't that great. Mm-hmm. But again, we had to use the relevant civilian labor force mm-hmm. because I can't count, I can't compare to the percentage of Hispanics who live in Houston right. to be the, the percentage that I have for the workforce at NASA. What I want is what percentage of those Hispanics can do the work that I need done at NASA. Mm-hmm. That number was my target when I was director of EO, building those numbers up. As far as the the atmosphere around NASA during the time of the Apollo era, like we were saying, the camaraderie and everybody in unison and the excitement and in comparison to the shuttle era and now the space station era, um, how do you think the morale has changed? Remember, I said, you know, in the Apollo era, it was well-defined. Mm-hmm. The support was there. Mm-hmm. The public, the government, uh, the skills weren't... We needed more of the skills, okay? Because mm-hmm. there weren't enough people for what we're doing, we were doing at the time. But what's different now is that there is no f- real focus. Mm-hmm. Every administration changes the goals. Mm-hmm. I mean, and imagine your personal life, if you can say, okay, I'm, I've got this five-year plan, and then something happens, and you can't follow that five-year plan. Well, mm-hmm. that's kind of what's happened to the space pro- program, that every administration comes in with a, new, with a new edict, and then, unfortunately, for whatever reasons, doesn't follow through. Yeah. Okay, So you're in a project and somebody tells you cancel that, you're not gonna do that anymore. That's frustration. Okay? Yeah, and it affects employee morale oh, as absolutely. well. And the rounds of layoffs. Absolutely. And the budget I, cuts. I and... think my era, this era from mid 50s to probably mid 70s, mm. maybe close to 80, was the best that mm-hmm. it will ever be. Mm-hmm. And, and it's never going to be that way again, mm-hmm. ever. And I was reading um, John David McCullough's book about the uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. Mm-hmm. I saw so much correlation to NASA mm-hmm. because it was a humongous project to build this bridge. Mm-hmm. The people were all excited, and they then they turn on you, then they're fickle, and you know they lose interest real, very fast. Yes, the politicians lost interest. There was there was fraud. There was this. So many things that I could co- correlate to the program. It's not awesome anymore. Okay, bridges across, you know, Br- Brooklyn Bridge was awesome once upon a time. Going to the 
into space was awesome once upon a time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, other awesome airplanes were awesome once, and we get used mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. we, we normalize, and then it's not as exciting anymore. Yeah. Until something happens that pushes us to want to be interested again, when another country lands something somewhere where we want to be, that mm -hmm. will make a push. But it might be too late. Okay. Landing on the moon 2024. What, what's your prediction? Right. We can do, you, do, do it. Do you think we'll see it? We can do it, but I don't think we will. There's... Maybe it will be later. <laughs> Depending on our well, I saw today our 20, political <laughs> yeah the political climate. I saw today twenty thirty something. Yeah, twenty twenty four was the first date I heard. Today yeah. I saw twenty thirty something. I think we can do it. Yeah, we can. We mm -hmm. have the resources. We have, we have the knowledge. We have people willing to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you keep turning the burner off and on, yeah, it's never going to get to where it's going to get there. Yeah, until somebody else does it before we do that unfortunately will be the push and yeah. that's not the right way and and there the international partnerships with the other agencies what's your opinion about that those are necessary i mm -hmm. think but we're one earth you know we're, mm -hmm. we have boundaries because they're political boundaries but we are one earth uh we need you know the Earth is, is changing, you know, you have all these issues with climate change, whatever, whatever you want to believe. But just the mere fact that our population is growing so fast. Mm -hmm. How are we going to accommodate that on a worldwide basis? Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, it has to be a world effort. Mm -hmm. Countries can't afford it on their own. So until that big meteorite hits us. Yeah, <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's a whole other story, yes. So. This past Friday, their history was made. Mm -hmm. We had an all-woman spacewalk team. We had two spacewalkers around the space station, uh, two ladies. This had never happened before. Um, what was your reaction when you heard the news and, and you saw those two ladies you know, I around the space <clears throat> station? <laughs> I actually did not watch it. Uh -huh. I was at the Hilton with uh, the... Uh, Association of Space Explorers. Mm -hmm. These are the international astronauts, cosmonauts, who have, the qualification is you have to have at least one orbit around the Earth to be a member of that. Mm -hmm. And we were working, uh, some of us with a NASA Alumni League volunteer to, to work. So I've missed it, mm -hmm. okay. However, you know, I, I worked with Kathy Sullivan when she was the first American woman mm -hmm. to do a spacewalk. So it wasn't as exciting as I thought it would be, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, you know, I, I kind of feel like if we don't quit focusing on firsties, that we kind of put them in a separate category of where well, they're just astronauts doing their job. Yeah. You know, and, and I learned that from the women astronauts that I worked with. They really did not want to be set aside they wanted to be one of the guys and guys being generic i i have um the same view as well as as a woman and as a hispanic that sometimes we're so hyper focused on how make what makes us different that we should be more focused on how we are equal yes. as americans as yes. humans yes you know um it, it it did make me happy to see both ladies up there um but it, you know, a few months ago, it was supposed to happen, and something happened. You know, the suit didn't mm -hmm. fit, or, or mm -hmm. whatever, and it was a bit of a PR faux pas. <laughs> something <laughs> like that. Yes. Um, yes. But you know, it's a, I'm always happy to see women fly in space and and do the technical stuff and the, and the hard stuff that only men used to do. So well, and, and we've see, we've come somewhat we've come, a long yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. And see, it, and it wasn't like I never doubted they could do it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, given the opportunity mm -hmm. to get ready for it, to meet the criteria, to the, the opportunity to practice, 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 mm -hmm. they should be mm -hmm. able to do it. Okay. Right. And, and all of them, uh, I interviewed 20 spacewalkers for my dissertation, and all of them had similar experiences, men and women. Mm -hmm. They all had the experiences of the suit. 
-hmm. The suit was built for that original generation, okay, just yes. like the program, okay. Mm -hmm. And the suit was built uh, for big guys yeah, because they could handle the elements and all of that. Uh, as we changed the workforce in the astronaut office, they came smaller, they came female, uh, they came skinnier, you know, it's a very diverse built of, of people. Then the suit, again, somebody had to make the decision, well, let's make a modification. Let's suggest, just mm -hmm. like sending women to test pilot school, we, we have to make some adjustments. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, then others can't participate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the suit became an issue for participation. And some women and men in the astronaut office kept after it and kept after it. Mm -hmm. And now the suit is flexible enough that it can be uh, it's like yeah. one suit doesn't fit all. It has to be adjusted. So, so you make adjustments, and if you're going to include anybody who looks different from the original group, you keep making adjustments, making adjustments. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I really, I mean, I'm very proud of anybody who goes out to space, but it, it's like, it's what don't is keep expected. focusing. Yeah. yeah, that's the job. They should be able to do it. And, you know, Kathy did it years ago. That mm -hmm. was awesome because she was mm -hmm. the first one. But a Russian had already done it yeah. by the time we did it. I believe it's partially because NASA is so eager to get the support from the public yes. Yes. Um, that they they try to highlight as much as they can of the positives. Or, or the press or yeah. whoever is looking yeah. for a good story. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I tell my students, you know, look for the common denominators. Mm -hmm. Don't look for the differences. Right. Okay. I mean, when I married a non-Hispanic, non-Mexican, and he's Polish, Ukrainian descent. Oh, wow. Yeah, you'll meet him <laughs> in a little bit. I mean, we were, we've been married for 52 years, okay? Never did I ever think I would marry out of my culture. Yeah. I like tell my students I was going to marry a tall, dark, handsome Mexican. I married a short Polak. But, like Vicente Fernandez? <laughs> yeah, I like, like doing a lot of, <laughs> lot of hair. <laughs> but, but it's the common denominators that were the attractor. We were both from immigrant families. We were both Catholic. We were both from big families. We were both at NASA. You know, those are the things that brought us together. Yes, we have lots of differences, mm -hmm. okay? But it's, it's that core where you come together that makes the difference yes. and and you know when you talk about teams well, does that mean we all have to wear the same uniform mm. i like to say we collaborate because we do that here yeah because you have the common goal yes mm -hmm. but the rest of us stay however we want to stay right i think we need to think more that way yeah you know um another thing i wanted to ask you since you've been in human resources and you've worked with equal opportunity um i have come into contact with interns at NASA, female interns, mm -hmm. and they're millennials, and they are the new generation, and, you know, in their generation, it is more acceptable for women to have careers and to be independent and to be in these STEM um, fields or mm -hmm. be astronauts and whatnot. But it was a little disheart disheartening and a little bit disappointing to hear them say that they still get discriminated against. There are still, you know, some sly comments or insinuations as far as them being women in the areas they're working in, in aerospace or at NASA. Um, from your experience, for ladies, maybe young ladies that are listening to your interview, what would be your advice on how to deal with these situations? Well, you know, and it's how always to be the catalyst of change. It it it's always existed. My advice was always be assertive. Mm -hmm. Stand your ground. Uh, if if it's unfavorable to you, say something about it. If it's not, just ignore it. Mm -hmm. uh, if it starts to become part of a, a challenge or an obstacle for your career, you better you'd better address it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think from the very beginning, I, I I was very assertive, and maybe that was my home training. My mom was very assertive in a nice way, so that she could get her way and not make my make my dad get upset. Yeah. So so. One thing that I heard from a very prominent female astronaut, when I told her I was teaching, she said, are you teaching these young ladies not to be snowflakes? Uh, uh, and I said... That term is very popular nowadays. I, I had never heard it. I had never heard it. I said, what does that mean? And she said, they have a meltdown. 
if, if things are not the way they think they should be. Yeah. In an environment where you are the still not quite the insider, mm. you have to learn to just overcome it somewhere or another until you become one of them. Okay. And becoming one of them is you figure out what 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 it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, you you deal with with comments if it's going to bother you. You don't run to HR every time somebody looks at you. Yes. Okay. I I could I saved myself so many trips to HR. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because and it's 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 unfortunate because I've worked in an area where a lady or two have has gone to HR and then it just causes an atmosphere in the department and you know it, well never to discourage someone from filing a complaint or going when it's something okay, serious when it's something yeah. serious but you know when you accuse somebody of, of discrimination or inappropriate action today those are against the law mm -hmm. okay so if you go in and tell HR or EO that that I have done something to you then you're insinuating that I'm a criminal because I'm breaking the law yeah. And so how can I still be friendly to you if you've accused me of being a criminal? It's just human nature. Right. Okay. My deal when I was dealing with discrimination complaints, and I have to brag a little bit, we had in the nine years that we counted, we had like 350 visits of people that had some kind of issue. Mm -hmm. From that, we had seven formal complaints in that whole time. The other mm -hmm. sinners had double digits every year, okay? Mm -hmm. What we started to practice was a collaborative discussion. I would, you would come in and you'd say, you know, so-and-so did something to me. And I'd say, um, can I call him in so you can tell him to his face? Can I call HR? Can I call the union if I have to? Can I call the supervisor? And 90% of the time they'd say yes. 90% mm -hmm. of the time they'd say, you know, this has been so good because I can tell you directly what I'm feeling. And the person who was the perpetrator yeah. would say, I had no idea that's how you were feeling. Right, and it's okay. communication. Yes, it's just communication, yes. Yeah. And so I, I had so many issues that went away because I forced them, I facilitated, I directed the traffic and all that, and I forced them to tell each other, don't tell me and then I tell her. And because you know that game that we play where you walk around and the circle. It never gets resolved. It never, and it never yeah. gets, the, the interpretation is never the same. Yeah. Uh, my mother used to say, hablando se entienden las cosas. Yeah. If you talk it over, if you dialogue, you will understand. Okay? Yeah. So for the young women, so my advice to the young women is if you are going to go into an arena that is not yet common for women or Hispanics or blacks or whatever, mm. then brace yourself and learn to be assertive, learn to communicate, learn to speak out about the obstacles you're seeing mm -hmm. so that they don't build up and then your career is affected. Right. I yeah. mean, it's plain and simple to me. <laughs> so have you met your role model? Is there is there someone that you wish you had met that inspired you or I've you had, looked up to? I've had lots mm -hmm. in every phase of my Career. I mean, alive or dead, you know, uh, be a lot of them dead now. Yeah. But uh, initially, you know, if I had looked for somebody like like me to be like, I wouldn't. I never. I wouldn't have found somebody. Mm -hmm. So what I looked for was uh, there was a lady named Marilyn Bakhtin. She had been a secretary. She was an admin. She was George Lowe's secretary. George Lowe is one of the Apollo fathers, and she became my mentor just mm -hmm. because I said one day I want your job. Not your job. I said, but I want a job just like yours. And mm -hmm. from then on, she let me do her little under things. But, but I learned from that, and I could claim those tasks later. Uh, there was Virginia Hughes, who was head of the Federal Women's Program, who fought a lot of battles for us as far as making the women part of the picture. Um, and then I think the mentors, the, the men who were my mentors, and they were pretty much all men, mm -hmm. uh, they were serious. Uh, uh, about the program, they were not touchy feely until you discover them, and then they do have a, a, a nice, gentle touch to them. Mm -hmm. But I think my biggest heroes are my parents. Yeah, 
My mother was certainly an, inspir an inspiration. Um, it takes a lot of courage to leave your country behind yeah. and, and yeah. come to a new country where you don't know the language, yeah. you don't have a penny to your name. And she fought battles for us and she pushed us. She was very strict. My father was extremely strict too, but she she was the the mediator with him. Yeah. So that today he's still our, he's also our hero. He could have become you know some some bad guy, yeah. but the way she she made us talk to him and deal with him, mm -hmm. he's he's our hero too. We have so much gratitude for what our parents did for us. Not not only in the tangible values that they gave us, but also in all the lessons that they taught us. And, and one thing was, you'll never fight with each other. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to being together. There are six of us and our, our spouses. And the kids look forward to being together. Mm -hmm. So I think all around, she's probably my, my favorite mm -hmm. role model. Um, and how about you? Whose life have you changed? Hopefully. A few people. Mm -hmm. I I will run into somebody. Uh, I was at a thing at NASA the other day, and this young lady comes up to me and she says, "Do you remember me?" And it's like, I think so. You know, <laughs> I don't. And she said, "I remember you because I came to talk to you in the EO office, something about the baseball team and women not being on the team, and and you talked to me and you made it. You reached out. Now it's not even a question mm -hmm. about women on the baseball team." Okay, yeah. and she's got a significant position now too. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, my students, who are my current people now, mm -hmm. they will, I ask them to do a reflection in, in their end of semester thing, and they will invariably say, you made me change my mind, I'm going this direction because of what you taught me, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, it's working. Uh, I would like to say that my nieces and nephews because uh, they all kind of have gotten involved with NASA. Mm -hmm. uh, my one nephew, he's a flight surgeon in Florida. Mm -hmm. He worked at NASA for a while. Um, he had an internship at NASA because Pete and I worked at NASA. My niece at the orthopedic, she mm -hmm. also had some things to do with NASA. I've got two nieces, three nieces that work at NASA. Oh, so wow. I think it's all in the family. Yeah, I think it's all. And then my son, who works at NASA too, yeah. so he's uh, he's with my, the company that I work with. So so there, I think, in my fifty some odd years now, uh, I would like to think that I planted some seeds, mm -hmm. and and even if I don't get to see the the full growth, that mm -hmm. they will remember. And and so much of what I learned was from people like that. Yeah. So, so I, I think my favorite people are those that realize that we have to give back. Right, and you pay it forward. Yes, you pay it forward. Mm -hmm. And there's so much need for that. You know, we don't understand that the slightest gesture can be significant to somebody. Well, thank you so much for this conversation, Estella. It's, it's a pleasure. It's, it's very inspiring and and. I, I was really looking forward to this. And, Thank you. And I've I've learned sitting here with you quite a bit about NASA's history. For me, it was a real privilege, a real mm -hmm. blessing, if I should say, to have been at NASA at the time that it was. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea that it would evolve into this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really pleased that I got, I made the decision to rebel against my parents. <laughs> 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 oh, but yeah, I, I had a little bit of that rebellious streak myself. <laughs> I mean, you can, as, as successful women, you kind of have to have a little bit in the Hispanic culture. Yes, because indeed. And it's not bad stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if our parents thought about it, they will see that trait in themselves. Mm -hmm. So we're just exercising what our genes are demanding we do. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Idea Me podcast. If you are enjoying our content, subscribe to our channels. We also appreciate your reviews and feedback. Have a great day.